Hello, my name is Sagar Shah, and the reason I chose to present on retrograde mailing of femur fractures is because I can see more patients coming into the clinic for follow-up for this procedure, and I wanted to learn more about it and present on the topic. I have no disclosures. Some of the things that I will focus on in this presentation include the background of the procedure, including the advantages over the anti-grade mail, some of the indications for the procedure, caveats and complications associated with the procedure, and briefly I'll compare it to any injury now. Stuart Green first introduced the retrograde intramedullary nail for supracondylar femur fractures, and the reason that he introduced this is because he studied the traditional way to fix these fractures, which was often with a angled blade plate or a compression screw on the lateral side, and he found that this created a high rate of malunion because the fracture was put into very stress. Retrograde intermediary nailing was a solution to that problem. Some of the advantages of retrograde nailing include ease in identifying the entry point regardless of the patient habitus, ease in positioning the patient using the supine position, and shorter prep time. A theoretical advantage is that retrograde nailing avoids the vasculature of the femoral head. And I say theoretical because adult literature rarely reports ABF from anti-grade nailing, and pediatric literature reports a small risk. Indications for retrograde nailing include supracondylar fractures, as I mentioned earlier, but also femoral shaft fractures, which will be the main focus of my talk. The combination of ipsilateral femoral neck and shaft fractures is especially problematic. Anti-grade nails are usually not indicated for these injuries because the adduction required to enter the piriformic or trochanteric process puts very stress on the femoral neck fracture. This may lead to malunion of the neck fracture. The neck fracture is a top priority in these cases because of the potential risk of ABM of the femoral head. There really isn't a consensus on how to fix these injuries in the literature. However, retrograde nailing with a dynamic hip screw or cancel of screws has shown promise. Some of the other indications involve patient positioning. Oftentimes in polytrauma patients, lateral positioning is not possible because of visceral injuries or something such as a chest tube sticking out of the lateral side. Multiple fractures are also difficult to position and are better treated in supine positions in most or some cases because if there's a bilateral femur fractures or ipsilateral tibial fractures, the fractures can be fixed at the same time without repositioning. And in case of the tibial fracture, they can be fixed through the same incision as the femoral shaft fracture. Retrograde nailing may be beneficial for severely obese patients because the entry point is easy to find and they are easy to position supine. Pregnancy is also a relative indication for retrograde nailing because there's less radiation to the fetus. The operative technique of this procedure is a little bit out of the scope of this presentation. However, I will discuss some of the caveats and complications of the procedure. Some of the complications that I'll be focusing on in this discussion include malunion, knee pain, hardware removal, and infection. The term malunion is used quite loosely throughout the literature, but some authors define it as a rotation, length, or angulation defect postoperatively. And I want to talk a little bit about rotational malunion, as some of the early studies mentioned that there's a theoretical risk of rotational malunion with retrograde nailing compared to other methods of fixation because this procedure is done percutaneously and it's, uh, the knee is flexed the whole time. However, recent studies have found that there's no significant difference in rotational defect in retrograde nailing versus other methods of fixation. Kretek first described an approach to interoperatively look at femur rotation after fixation, and that is the lesser trochanter shape side. 
To do this, you have to position the patient so that both patellas are facing anteriorly. The non-operative leg, shown by letter A in this figure, is compared to the operative leg um, intraoperatively using fluoroscopy. And the lesser trochanter, the shape of the lesser trochanter, is compared between the non-operative leg and the operative leg. If there's external rotation of the distal segment, the lesser trochanter appears smaller, as in letter C. And the reason for this is the proximal segment seems internally rotated relative to the distal segment, if the distal segment is externally rotated. Vice versa, if the distal segment is internally rotated, then the proximal segment of the femur appears as if it's externally rotated and the lesser trochanter looks larger than the non-operative leg, as shown in letter D. And several studies have mentioned that this is a sensitive way to look at rotation intraoperatively, and Kim et al. even looked at uh, the inter-observer variability of standard deviation and found that there's low false positive risk. Another disadvantage that early studies described was that of knee patients. Although the incidence of knee pain is relatively high, reported by most studies, it's tough to determine if the retrograde nail is the source of the knee pain. Femoral shock fractures are high energy injuries and force is oftentimes propagated through the knee. Several of these patients would have knee pain regardless of if they had the retrograde nail for fixation or not. There is one preventable cause of knee pain, and that involves the distal locking screw placement. Before I talk about the screw, I want to describe normal osteology of the femoral condyle. You can see that the shape of the femoral condyle is that of a trapezoid, and not a rectangle. The condyle tapers from the posterior to anterior direction, and a surgeon must be aware of this, especially when looking at an AP radiograph, where it's difficult to make any anterior tapering. This figure shows what you would see on intraoperative fluoroscopy on the top layer, shaded in purple, compared to what you would see grossly intraoperatively on the bottom layer. On the left, you see that in the radiograph, the screw looks as if it's of appropriate length. However, you can see on the gross picture that the tip of the nail extends several millimeters past the cortex. In a subcutaneous position, such as that of the femoral condom, the extension of this nail could cause irritation and pain at the knee and lead to cardinal removal. On the oblique radiograph on the right side, you can see that the tip of the nail is, is extended beyond the cortex, and it's much easier to visualize this on the oblique radiograph than the AP radiograph. When the screw is inserted appropriately, it looks as if the nail is within the condyle on the AP radiograph, and this is because the lateral borders of the AP radiograph, the lateral medial borders, are looking at the outline of the posterior condyle. However, the nail is inserted in the anterior aspect of the condyle. On an oblique view, once again, you can appreciate the length of the screw and how it's appropriate. Uh, therefore, an oblique radiograph should be taken intraoperatively in all retrograde nailing procedures. The last complication I want to discuss is that of septic knee arthritis. I would have expected that septic knee arthritis would be a common complication since you're introducing a conduit from the knee joint to the femur fractures. Especially in open fractures, I would expect a connection between bacteria and the knee. However, studies have shown that the risk of septic knee arthritis is relatively low. There was one study by Alvorsen which looked at 185 femur fractures treated with retrograde nailing, and zero were found to have septic knee arthritis on follow-up. O'Toole et al. also did a study of open fractures only, and only found that one of them developed septic knee arthritis. 
Briefly, I want to show my review of the literature comparing anti-grade to retrograde nailing for femoral shock fractures. Several prospective randomized trials have shown that there is no difference in clinical outcomes between the two approaches. I think that more research needs to be done, but the literature thus far shows that the two approaches are clinically equivalent. In summary, retrograde nailing may be a useful alternative to integrated nailing, especially in certain clinical scenarios, such as that of polytrauma patients, ipsilateral femoral neck and shaft fractures, obesity, and pregnancy. Assessing rotation with the lesser trochanter as a shape sign may be useful intraoperatively to avoid malunion. Oblique views are absolutely necessary when inserting the distal locking screw to ensure appropriate length and possibly prevent further hardware removal in the future. Septic knee arthritis is a potential but low risk complication associated with retrograde nailing of femoral shaft fractures.